You're listening to the Startup Soiree Podcast, episode number 10. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Startup Soiree Podcast. This is your host, Patrick Reif. I am so happy to have all of you here with us again. Today, we're going to talk to um, a gentleman I had the pleasure of meeting, I think sometime last month, I was at a, uh, I was at a Baltimore Creative Mornings talk, and uh, I think the third person in a row had kind of said, you absolutely have to meet Andrew Rose. And uh, the previous two people that had made that recommendation were just as emphatic that I had been really screwing up by not knowing him already. Um, So I quickly ran uh, ran to um, my Gmail window and I sent Andrew an email and I said, hey man, it seems like we're blowing it pretty big here, so we should probably get together. Um, He invited me out to Zest Social Media and we just had an absurdly uh, intoxicating conversation that ran the gamut from parsing data for the benefit of, of law firms to hybridizing different blends of cotton and, and then stepping it one further to pick the winners out of each crop and hybridize them. So uh, it's going to be a great conversation today, and I don't want to say too much. So Andrew Rose... Welcome to the Startup Soiree podcast. Thanks for being our guest today. Hey, it's my pleasure, Patrick. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, do me a favor. Give give the Soiree community a little bit of a snapshot about Andrew Rose and, and kind of what your trajectory has been like and, and how you ended up at Zest. Sure. Well, I guess it all started when I failed out of college. And I really didn't want to go home and face the music. I just wanted the party to continue. And you know, if you're young and, and single and you want to party, where do you go? You go to New Orleans, right? Absolutely. That'd be my first stop. So um, got an old beat-up car and a buddy of mine, and we drove down to uh, the French Quarter and found a place to live. And uh, I, I hooked up with a saute, a sweet saute job on Bourbon Street, and it's been a long time down there. And uh, for those of you who have never been to New Orleans and have a hedonistic vein in your body, that's the place you need to go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the really the unexpected pleasure for me started when I was walking down to uh, my job and um, heard somebody whistle at me. And I turned around, a couple of guys were whistling at me. I'm like, wow, that's pretty different. And quickly found out there is a very large gay population in New Orleans, which, you know, if you think about it from a supply and demand thing, I'm not that all that much to look at. So thank God we don't have the video on. But uh, if you're a, a straight guy and you're living in the quarter, um, all of a sudden your stock goes up with the single females in the town. So, uh, it was a good time for me and uh, kind of sowed my wild oats and decided that I wanted to take it on the road. And so I bopped around the Southwest and spent some time getting out to California working as an itinerant line cook at a whole bunch of different restaurants and a whole bunch of different stations and living in campgrounds and trailer parks and crashing on people's couches and stuff like that. And did that for a few years and decided to go back to school. And uh, because I'd failed out of college, I couldn't transfer any, any credits anywhere. No one, no one wants an F. And uh, I had to start from scratch again. So I went to community college for a couple of years, uh, got some decent grades, transferred to a little school in Illinois, uh, graduated from there, and then uh, went out in the big bad world with a piece of paper and said, hey, I'm a college graduate. I can do things. And uh, no one really cares about that stuff. So my first job was working in a restaurant as a manager. And uh, I had to cut my hair real short and put a suit and tie on, uh, get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to work 10 hours a day. And, oversee a bunch of drug addicts, basically, and uh, try and keep the the wheels from falling off the bus long enough. And, you know, it was a grind. And I did that for about a year and a half and just completely hated my life. And I saved every bit of vacation I had. It'd take a single day. I'd backpack across Yellowstone with a buddy of mine. And uh, that's kind of where I got my head back on my shoulders. And when I got back from that, I decided to quit the, the restaurant industry for good. And Went to work for an outdoor retailer, an outfitter, and kind of climbed the corporate ranks there and did that for a while. Loved every minute of that. Learned a ton of stuff about loss prevention and human resources and operations and 
all the stuff that goes in the back end of a, of a retail environment. But I also was pretty cool because doing that, I got exposed to the North Face and Patagonia and Marmot and all the other vendors out there and made some really good friendships and got some kick-ass gear along the way. That's what brought me down here to, to Baltimore is we had a store in Towson that had tanked and asked me to come down and flip it and turn it around. And I did that. But the thing was, I fell in love with Baltimore. I, I had never been to Baltimore other than working for the job. And I hadn't planned on staying either. And when I got here, I was just amazed at how, you know, it was a right size city. I was living outside of New York City. New York City rocks. But it's massive. You can fit Baltimore in like one of the boroughs in New York City and not miss anything. Um, but coming down here, not only was the city the right size, but the people were really friendly. Um, the, the Inner Harbor is just gorgeous. And with a young family, it was just nice to have all this cultural stuff that was so accessible to us. So I left the job and didn't really know what to do. Uh, spoke to some people that I was related to that had made a ton of money in their lives. And they said, hey, listen, you know, you, you, you probably never thought about this, but the best thing for you to do is go into sales really easy. You make a ton of money. You don't work hard. Uh, I mean, they, they painted <laughs> this landscape for me that was incredible. So I said, sure, why the hell not? And I got a job in a boiler room, which is uh, a place where you sit with a bank of telephones and you try to call and sell people stuff over the phone. And it was like boot camp for sales. And, you know, you, you've got these, uh, this, what we call the Plantronic headset. And I had in one ear my boss yelling at me, and the other ear I was trying to sell to a prospect. It was a very schizophrenic type of existence, but I was coachable. And it was boot camp, and I wanted to learn how to sell. And I learned every single type of selling there was, all the different closes from the, the puppy dog clothes to overcoming objections. And I got to be really good at selling on the phone. But it was just a heinous environment. So... I left that and went to work for a little payroll company, and uh, because I was so good at picking up the phone and just calling people, I started bringing in a lot of business. And one thing led to another, and it, uh, it came to the day that I was bringing these giant accounts, and so many of them had outgrown their accounting firm but were loyal to their accounting firm and didn't want to leave. And a few of them started asking me, who do I recommend? And I knew a bunch of CPA firms out there, but there were only two that I really trusted. And so I went to both of these firms and negotiated reciprocal agreements with them. And one of the firms wanted to hire me. And they wanted me to be their marketing director. And I had no friggin' clue what that meant. And when, they, when the offers got to be pretty big, and I kept on saying no to them. I didn't want to put myself in a position that I was getting a giant paycheck but I had no clue what I was doing. But as you know, when you're the pretty girl that dance, they keep on asking until you dance. So they finally came to me and said, what's it going to take? Get you come work here? And I made just a ridiculous comp offer to them. And they said, yeah, where well, can you start? So I get over there and they give me this giant office with a big budget and agency on retainer. And I'm sitting at this, this huge desk, just ornate desk in this an office I can't even imagine anyone sitting in. It's mine. And they're all coming to me and say, okay, what are we doing now? What, what's our next play? And I had no clue. I was so far over my head, you know. It's kind of like being given the keys to a Lamborghini and not driving a stick shift. I mean, that's what it was like. So I figured I, you know, before they put the bolt in the back of my head out back, I would uh, do what I could. And I formed a little peer support group of marketing directors and you know, 10, 12 of us. And every month I'd bring a speaker in that would teach me what I needed to know that month to, to be effective at my job. And over the almost 12 years my group has been around, We've gone from just a small handful of people to, on LinkedIn, we have almost 50,000 members internationally in my group. And because of that, I've gotten my 10,000 hours plus in marketing, which has just enabled me to not only do my job effectively, but teach others how to do it. So a um, long story coming to how I got to be at Zest here. Uh, one of the things I did at this accounting firm was I launched, I took a small local practice group and made them national powerhouses in their industry. And in doing so, I'd hired just a brilliant marketing, um, un untouched phenom from Towson. And she worked with me side by side, not only understanding all the algorithmic flow of search and how social influence search, but also the science behind human relations. Because we're selling CPAs. We're selling a service. We're not selling a product. And, and CPAs oftentimes are not the sexiest people around. So we had to make them rock stars in accounting. And so she saw all the science that went on behind the scenes to do this. 
at the end of her tenure with me, she decided to start her own company. And I supported her, became a client, referred a bunch of my friends over to her. And uh, as I spoke across the country and people would want to hire me, I would say, well, you can't really hire me. and I'm not interested in leaving my job, but you can hire Zest. And they will do for you what they did for me. And in doing so, was able to expand her client base across the country. And fast forward six years later, uh, they, they, they came to me and said, hey, would you be interested in being president of the company? And I said, yeah. You know, I've got, had a lot of offers, but this is the only one that's compelling enough that I would say yes, because the entire team, the entire vision are built around all these formulas that I tested out in the accounting firm. And so in September, I... Well, it was actually late August. I went off the grid, spent three weeks in the wilderness, came back, gave notice, and then uh, two weeks later started here. So long story how I came to this point in time, Patrick, but I appreciate you asking. Yeah, that's a that's a, a, a thorough but also fascinating answer to the question um, and, and definitely um, fairly convoluted. I think one of the things that is, is kind of hidden late inside of that story is, you know, kind of that although zest isn't isn't necessarily your company in in a lot of ways zest is very much something that you you really helped um help to make what it is today is is what it sounds like to me that that your kind of your vision and, and support um created an environment for uh for zest to really thrive yeah, yeah, indeed. And and the fact that our clients are mostly service companies, law firms, CPA firms, financial advisors, it, it all fits into that vision that I had. And, you know, again, how do you sell a professional? I mean, that, at the end of the day, that's one of the hardest things that you can do because it's not the packaging. You know, that's not going to sell. It's not the logo. It's the person and how well they perform. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's what you can, it, it's, it's, it's what the actual heartbeat predicts and not necessarily the the static that that surrounds it um j- just curious on a on a i'm kind of really interested in 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 some of the more fundamental specifics uh of of your kind of day-to-day um you know when when you and i got a chance to sit down and talk a few weeks ago um you know i think i think it was definitely a really easy conversation but there are a lot of things that caught my attention um, and, and one of those is, is kind of the story that you told me about the cotton balls that were on your desk <laughs> and your, and your interest in, in that space. But, you know, what it did was it, it, and I think you, you were using it to this, to this end as well, but it helped to really, um, to illustrate your interest in kind of algorithmic data and the way that we, you know, the way that we draw conclusions back from the tests that we, that we put in place and, and, you know, how we change based on what our feedback is from those tests. And then, and then we do it again and we do it again. Um, is there something that you can think, think of in your, you know, in your childhood and your adolescence, um, that, that sat as the, as the real kind of, I don't know the 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 hook in your cheek to that specific to whatever to that uh, f- interest of yours that that I'm kind of trying to highlight. Is there something that you can think of that that's based out of? You know, there actually is. Um, you know, I was a party boy for a long time, following the dead around, had real long hair, and I really think that I can pinpoint that catalyst of change to when I read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance for the third time. And the first two times I read it, I got hung up on the whole motorcycle thing. I'm not really mechanically oriented. Uh, so the third time I read it, I said, okay, listen, everyone said this is a great book. I'm going to read it and ignore everything having to do with motorcycles and focus on everything else. And that was the epiphanal moment in my life, the aha moment, when it, it really boils down to life as a quest for quality. You want to figure all that stuff out. And so whether it's determining which strain of cotton grows best in Maryland or how to pull the iron oxide out of the creeks near my house and uh, melt it down in a backyard furnace into some sort of ingot that I can play with. Um, all that curiosity really came from Zen and Art of Motorcycle Man. So uh, that was that's a good question there, buddy. Thank you. How about uh, how about e- role models and or mentors? Um, they can they can be two different things to some people, and they can be the same thing to others. Um, is there a, a space where 
either or of those ha have played a role in your life? Oh, without a doubt. And I've always emulated the people that I've respected most. Uh, so back in my um, outdoor retailer days, there was a guy named Tom Zulo. And uh, if he's listening, Tom, definitely drop me a line because I haven't been able to find you anywhere out there in the world. But he taught me a brilliant piece of information. And I was in a, in a conflict situation in, in one of the stores. And he said, Andrew, listen, before you respond, you can't respond adequately unless you've seen the world through everyone else's eyes. And so I, I really, that helped me immensely in the fact that I don't immediately jump to conclusions or take a side in argument until I've seen the world through everyone else's eyes. And now the business schools call it a 360 view, but I didn't know what it was called at the time. It was just a, a, you know, a wait and figure it out. And oftentimes the right path will expose itself. Um, and since then I've had a lot of situational mentors, people that if I uh, reach a certain crossroads or think I might know the answer, but I'm not positive, I'll bounce it off of them. And those people have really helped me just incredibly. So I, and, you know, this, I go back to another book that I read and it's called Team of Rivals. It was about Abraham Lincoln and how when he ran for president, he had all these acrimonious opponents. And when he became president, he wanted them all in his cabinet. And how do you manage all those disparate personalities and reach an end goal that, that helps the nation? And, you know, that was that's sort of the business school lesson of the book. But the lesson I took away from the book was Abraham Lincoln, everything he did, he was looking 200 years in the future. How would his action today influence the future? And so what that really helped me do was push my time horizon out. So you always want to have uh, certain goals you want to reach in a certain amount of time. But I'm always either secondarily or tertiarily looking at what is this going to mean in 15 years or 20 years? How is what my action today going to impact the future? Um, did that sort of answer the question? That slam dunk the question. <laughs> that slam dunk the question. So in terms of... Um, of, of personal routines, um, w anything, anything critical that you do every day that you, that you really value and think about, you know, being one of your, I don't know, one of your focusing customs. Sure. There's two things I do. I read every day. Right now I'm reading the 48 powers of law, which is by the same author that did the 33 strategies of war. It's just a brilliant book. I'm loving every single minute of it. Uh, but I'm also an avid outdoorsman, and every every fall I go off grid for a few weeks, no phone, no nothing, just go out and survive. So from pretty much a week from now until the fall, I'm going to be doing some hardcore training, and that's a lot of trail running and um, calisthenics and just ways to get my core and my legs up to where they need to be for the trek in the fall. Um, so a lot of exercising, but over the winter, I'm just a glutton. I just eat and drink a whole bunch of stuff I shouldn't. Get <laughs> um, so where are you doing your trail running? Um, usually in the Lock Raven Reservoir area. I um, like the little gunpowder a whole lot. Not a lot of people get on those trails. But oftentimes, I'm, I'm not even on trails. So I just follow animal paths and just go out for anywhere from 8 to 20 miles a day just so you can kind of get to that level. Because when you get out of elevation, it's really difficult to train for that down here at sea level or just right around sea level. So will you will you l literally hit the hit the trail and run eight miles after having just been a snoozing bear all winter? No, you got to work up to that, pal. Yeah. You know, I might be able to get two and a half miles out in the first run, but uh, you know, you, you work up to it. But it doesn't take long, especially when you've been doing it for twenty years. Your body's kind of conditioned to it, so it, it knows about the the gluttonous period, and then it knows about the training period. So it's you know the the time of scarcity and the time of abundance. So the time of abundance is about to end. <laughs> uh -huh. So aside from your um, your reading of uh, the books, uh, Forty Eight Powers of Law, uh, specifically at the moment, are there other places where you get information every day? Are you are you a news reader? Are you a you know um, do you do you read social media and marketing blogs? Uh, anything along those lines? That's a great question. Um, I'm an avid Google News reader, so it's customized to what my likes are. Every every day and, and moments during the day, I'm checking Google News. In terms of media sources, I love Mashable. I think they do a great job of looking around corners and bringing the future to me. Um, Advertising Age magazine is another one. They, they tend to trend spot about three weeks out. Love reading that stuff. Um, and DARPA, uh, the Defense Research uh, I guess lab it's a it's a place where uh, quantum mechanics go to fail and 90% of what they do they know they're gonna fail I love watching what's coming out of DARPA 
and Google X too. I love reading the Google X blog and seeing what they're working on right now because that's going to influence five, ten years out. It's what they're doing today. So I know that you've had some um, participation in the TEDx events, um, specifically the ones that have taken place here in Baltimore. Uh, I don't know if your relationship goes many years back or if it's um, something that you just worked on on the uh, event that took place uh, two weeks ago at Morgan State University. Um, but I was just wondering if you would just share a little bit of uh, your insight and experience in that space. Sure. Well, one thing that, as you know me, you'll learn uh, more and more about is I am addicted to volunteering. And I love to run an event. I necessarily sit in the audience. It makes me nervous. And I wonder what's going on behind the stage. So events like TED, um, the... I guess that's probably the biggest volunteer activity I do. Love Out Loud is coming up, and that's um, a nonprofit that uses uh, poetry as a means to reach kids in after school programs, both in a presentation, sort of a quasi debate league type of thing. Um, the, but I, I just really enjoy volunteering. So, TED and Ignite are a couple of the bigger uh, events where speakers get on stage. But I'm also curious about what's going to happen next. And I've been working with TED now for three years, but I'm, I really want to see some sort of event that brings a salon into the presentation piece because I think with a lot of these, you get excited. You hear a great speaker, you're inspired, but you're inspired on your couch or you're inspired in the, in the chairs in the audience, and there's not an engagement process. And I want to see some way for, so if someone moves my needle in a certain way, I want to go and sit down with them at a table with other people's, people whose needles were moved discuss it and figure out how we can get involved in whatever that thing is. And I think there's a greater thirst in the community for that sort of post-engagement um, mechanism. I don't know what it is. I know it will come because I feel it there, uh, and I'd like to see it happen. You know, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about doing um, as we kind of spill out with Startup Story, one, you know, the that, we wanted to create a space for for other company founders to network with each other. We wanted to create a space that uh, would kind of be a safe haven for the special conversations that, that take place for people that uh, have started something and they're responsible uh, to that thing. Um, and we really want to have it be valuable. So, you know, the first hour is definitely drinks and past hors d'oeuvres, and that last hour is, is similar to it. And in that regard, uh, our event is similar to other networking events in that it's an hour of hobnobbing and an hour of education and another hour of hobnobbing. But where where we see our difference and our value being is that we're really, um, we're putting a lot of emphasis and we're putting a lot of hard work into the education portion. And, and what we wanted to do, because I've been to a million of these things where you sit kind of like a, like, you know, like a, a trapped participant just kind of listening to someone talk and our whole perspective on it was this space that we want to create. You know, we're, we're funding this party exclusively with other people who have started companies. So they have a special insight. And in, inside of that space, the, the real value in the conversation actually exists when, when we manage to source everyone that's there. Because everyone that's there has a pretty credible perspective on whatever that subject might be. And, and, and some people will be you know, two years from it, and some people will be right in it, and some people will be two years past it, and some people will be 10 years past it. And all of those, all of those points of insight on whatever subject are, are a very valuable survey and read of, of the greater topic. So that's kind of been, you know, very much the goal. And that's why we've tried to have it be a town hall and, and why we're really doing a lot of questionnaires to, to find out what people are are finding success in it at our event, so we can really heighten that, and then so we can dump the stuff that they that they're not digging. Um, but w to expand on your point, one of the things that we've we've talked about doing, and I'm not sure if we will get things together to be able to do it for this Thursday, or if it's going to be programming that's going to start for our March event. But we're very much going to start creating two and three kind of little focus groups that will that will come the month following. Um, the actual soiree event, and those will be focused down on kind of the conversations and topics that we were dealing with there. So I really, um, I would love at some point you and I should, um, we should have a little bit of conversation about that so I can hear about what you see uh, in, in potential for it because I think that um, what we're creating and where we're going could hopefully incorporate some of your insight. Yeah, I think so. And, and again, I think that 
it, the timing is right. It's an idea whose time is right. It's just a matter of who's going to do it. Sure, absolutely. Well put, well put. Well, Andrew, that, that really brings us kind of to the conclusion of the time that we have. We try and keep it nice and short so that way um, it's, it's a great uh, f- fully stuffed chunk of information that's about a commute for everyone. So before we go, I would really love if you would just let all of our listeners know um, the best place to, to get in contact with you and, and maybe where they might follow along and uh, any other pertinent info you want to put out there before we wrap it up. That sounds great. I appreciate that, Patrick. Well, the best way to reach me is via email. Uh, I don't really like to talk on the phone. I won't respond to your text. And in fact, if you call me and text me too much, I'm going to change my phone number and not tell you what it is. I typically do that about every two years. But you can reach me at email at andrew at zestsms.com. And in terms of following me, uh, LinkedIn is probably the best place to find uh, places where I've spoken or articles I've written. I tend to put those up there fairly frequently. Perfect. That sounds good. Well, you heard it, guys. Those are the places for you to get in touch with Andrew Rose. Uh, Also, per use, we will have all these fun details, um, the book recommendations, the New Orleans recommendations, and uh, any other pertinent links that you might be interested in that you've heard over the course of this episode. We'll have them in the show notes. Andrew, from uh, myself and the entire Startup Story community, uh, can't thank you enough for being a guest today and spilling all this rad wisdom on us. Dude, thank you. It's my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Absolutely. Hey, I'll talk to you soon, bud. Take care. Take it easy.